What did you eat for breakfast? Oh my goodness. I ate my classic, this local sourdough bread with peanut butter. Welcome to Music on Your Own Terms, the podcast that aims to help musicians develop an entrepreneurial mindset through interviews, as well as discussing resources, concepts, successes, and more. Providing a platform to talk about negative emotions such as anxiety and depression in order to help overcome them in the context of music and reduce the social stigma. This is episode 138. This episode is sponsored by Ignite Your Music Career. You may remember in episode 90, I chatted to Craig Dodge about sync licensing and how he makes a living through writing music for TV, video games, and film. Musicians all over the world subscribe to Ignite Your Music Career and earn more royalties, more upfront sync fees, and more recurring revenue from their music. Whether you're a composer, singer-songwriter, band, beatmaker, or instrumentalist, your music can be earning you more money. Internationally acclaimed composer, musician, and music educator Craig Dodge has licensed his music in more than 1,000 TV show episodes, films, video games, and ads all over the world, and he will show you how you can too. Ignite gives you the information you need in a simple, accessible format, and you learn at your own pace. For just $6 a month, you get a video lesson each week on topics related to music licensing, from writing techniques to how to find your markets, and everything in between. You also get tools and activities to build the skills you need to be successful, and each lesson includes a royalty-free sound pack to download and use in your own music. The key to success in the music business today is to diversify your sources of revenue. Ignite will show you how. For more information or to subscribe to Ignite, visit the website at taris-studios.com or click the link on musiconyourownterms.com. Chatting with me this time out is Alex Krug from the Alex Krug Combo, all the way from Asheville, North Carolina. We hear about how early memories of her grandmother playing piano with Alex shaped her love of music, how she grew up learning guitar and drums, started writing her own music, and played drums in a grunge band as a teen. We also hear about the process of writing and recording with the combo, how her drummer Bill recorded several sessions for Bob Dylan's Blood on the Tracks album, Alex's thoughts on prejudice in the music scene, and finally, the challenges she's experienced over the course of the pandemic as a gigging musician. If you enjoy the podcast and want to show your support, I'd be really grateful if you would consider signing up for the mailing list to stay in the loop with everything going on with the show. Just head over to musiconyourownterms.com and click the link. While you're there, you can also visit the store and grab some merch, or just buy me a coffee and help out with the running costs of the show. Thanks for listening. Joining me on this episode is Alex Krug of the Alex Krug Combo, coming from Asheville, North Carolina. So how are you doing and welcome. Good morning. I'm doing fantastic. Excellent. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. So you came to me via uh, my good friend Joanna, who's been on the podcast multiple times. And actually, the last episode that we heard from her, she actually uh, had me put one of your songs on. So... You know, for, for regular listeners, you've already heard Alex's music. Oh, cool. So tell us about, you know, what, what you do and we'll go from there. Well, I write and perform music. I have a band called the Alex Crew Combo, like you just said. And I think what I do is I like to discover things about through music. I like discovering things in music and through music. And so my writing process and our band's process is all about discovery and getting into a song and seeing seeing where it wants to take us and just getting our hands in there and our ears and making discoveries together fantastic so you're you're primarily kind of americana blues rock but i but with that mentality i would imagine that's kind of, you you blur the lines quite quite often is that correct yeah yeah our um our drummer has a, a a deep jazz and fusion background and our bass player 
that plays in probably like 20 bands in Asheville and all over the spectrum. And our lap steel player loves like soul and Americana. And our guitar player has a jazz degree. And the person that Tina, who sings harmony with us, she has like a more of a folk background. So we all, Mm -hmm. and I have, I just like everything. Like I get bored. Mm -hmm. My problem is like, I will get bored. So yeah, that's a good problem to have. Yeah. Let's, let's go into your background. I mean, how did, how did you get into music in the first place? And then what led you to playing instruments and singing? Well, my grandma actually helped, helped me get into music since I, when I was really little, like she lived like two miles away and my parents would drop me off there, you know, when they needed to do something and she would watch me and she had a piano and she would just plop me in her lap. You know, when you're little adults, adults are huge. They're like big trees. And so I I would get in her lap and she would reach around me and play piano. So her hands are like at my eye level, you know, Mm. and she would just play piano. And she just was a really loving, kind person in my life and so that became associated with vibrations because you know pianos have those long strings they're very resonant there's a lot of real-time acoustic vibrations Mm -hmm. so I was experiencing that being super close to her and so even if she wasn't playing it it became that anytime I went to her house I would ask if I could play the piano And, you know, before I even knew how to play the piano, I would just find one note and just push it and and just get absorbed and enamored and taken up by that sound. So I think that's where it it began. That's fantastic. Yeah, my I I have very fond memories of my grandparents. My my grandfather played uh, piano a lot and and painted so that's where a lot of my musicality and artistic stuff comes from when when did you start playing like seriously like what what got the bug to actually pick it up um and like really you know deep dive into it well i think i always so i grew up in like rural the rural rolling hills of of maryland and I didn't have a lot of friends. And so I think I spent a lot of alone time just playing music. I had a keyboard eventually and my parents didn't want to buy me a guitar and they wouldn't let me have a drum kit. (laughs) So I saved up and I bought a guitar for 50 bucks, but it was a $50 guitar. So it was like the action was like, you know, the strings were like way far off and Mm-hmm. So it's kind of a hard guitar to learn on, but I, I slowly did. I was terrible at it. And, you know, I was super involved in church at the time. And I met this Christian grunge band and they needed a drummer. And I told them that I played drums, which <laughs> was not a flat out lie. It was a stretch. I played a uh, snare drum in a marching band, but I had never played a drum kit. So we started rehearsing at this Southern Baptist church that had a gymnasium and a drum kit. And I don't know why the church let us do this, but it was great because we could just turn up really loud and write Nirvana style Christian music. And I could be really loud and bad at drums. And then my parents, who had said I couldn't buy a drum kit, somehow allowed me to buy a kit uh, one piece at a time. Mm. So I would, I got a snare, I already had a snare. So then I got a kick drum and then I got a hi hat. And then, you know, I just got it each piece at a time. Um, and all of a sudden there was a drum kit, which is very manipulative on my part, (laughs) but you know, I was young and I really wanted to play drums. So I was always kind of, I, but I was writing my own music on the, on the side I always kind of had my own music and then I never really brought that forward Mm. until right after high school, I was in community college and I started a band with my cousins Mm -hmm. and that's when it kind of became like me collecting people around the music that I was writing and playing. And there's no one as good as your cousins to start playing music with. So absolutely. Yeah, that's great. At what point did you move from Maryland to Asheville? 
I moved to Asheville about 10 years ago. Okay. And I read in your bio that you were actually abandoned music. I mean, what, what was the reason for that? Oh, I did what? I abandoned it? Yes. Um, maybe I, I don't think I did. That might be, I'll have to go back and read. <laughs> I didn't abandon it for a while, for like a year or so. I worked in wilderness therapy. So I was working week on, week off. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't gig as much. Okay. Because I was in the woods with teens. Mm -hmm. So that happened. So so this is turning into like a Wikipedia fact or fiction. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. So you so you basically just weren't doing it as much. What what was the reason you started up more seriously and started this process of like really going for it? I just had an incredible community of friends who were so patient and encouraging. Mm. I don't think I sounded that great. <laughs> but somehow like my sister and my friends were just so encouraging that I kept pursuing it and, you know, thought I could play out and started booking shows and got even more encouragement and mm -hmm. started meeting more musicians that I really, you know, really had musical crushes on and admired. And they shockingly wanted to play with me. And we, we grew that. My original band in Asheville was with my ex. Mm -hmm. We were a trio. We played. She played violin, and then I had an upright bass player. And he played with me for a long time, and then he moved about an hour and a half away. So mm -hmm. that makes it difficult. But then I found Zach Page, and he's amazing. So that's that's killer. And I I did notice. I don't know if this is deliberate, but on your promo shots, you have. It looks like you have different combinations of people. Was that kind of a deliberate thing to say, you know, if if you ha if someone's not available, you can retool the, the band and like do a night with no drummer or do a night with no whatever. And, and you have the promo shots to go along with that setup. Is, is that a fair statement? Yeah, that's very fair and accurate. Like usually we'll play at least a four piece band mm -hmm. oops sorry there's a helicopter going over but uh we try and be our six-piece band and we're pretty consistent with who we have in the band but bill our drummer he lives about an hour away in brevard and we're up in nashville and you know and he's in a couple other bands mm -hmm. so he can't make every gig so yeah yeah we have and also some gigs are just small so right so we'll just play small and yeah it's fun i like the different combinations because it's it's like it's like a different flavor sure and with the photos also we took them during the pandemic <laughs> so <laughs> you know it was like who who is available to come out and and this and that so awesome so so by small you mean yeah we've got a stage and there's plenty of power and it's that meme where it's a piece of cardboard and a four-way <laughs> like, <laughs> totally yeah yeah like <laughs> is my app yeah. gonna blow up uh if you don't mind can we can we talk about bill for a second because is it true that he was on a bob dylan album yeah awesome yeah bill grew up in minnesota and went to high school with Bob Dylan's brother. Wow. And I might, I think I might have the facts right. So, but here's my <laughs> recollection of how it goes. So, so Bob Dylan recorded Blood on the Tracks with a band in New York. Mm. And Dylan was not satisfied with that recording, but they had already printed the, the uh, album covers and all the artwork. All that was already printed. But Bob Dylan was like, I want to redo this whole thing. So he went to studio back in his hometown in Minnesota and he asked his brother, he was looking for a drummer and his brother was like, yeah, and this guy is really great. His name's Bill, Bill Berg. And so Bill did the blood on the tracks sessions with Dylan and maybe another session, but maybe just that one. And it was a really magical time. He told me it was really cold out cause it was Minnesota. Uh -huh. When they tracked, it was, you know, very cold. And then he, he went on to have a, a really magical musical and artistic 
career. He got to meet a lot of neat people along the way, including Prince and Cat Stevens. And he worked for Disney and did a lot of illustrating. And the one thing that I absolutely admire and am inspired by about Bill is that the man could name drop like no other, but he is so <laughs> humble and so present and so so much of an artist and a humanitarian and a friend. And he has taught me so much about living with an open heart and not being bothered by pretentiousness in others mm. and not being apprehensive or guarded myself. And he's really taught me that. So That's fantastic. Yeah, so would you mind talking a little bit about the experience of the wilderness therapy? So you were working with troubled teens, and, you know, was there anything that you brought from that experience? Yeah, so I worked for a wilderness therapy company. It was definitely a for-profit company that worked with primarily the children of very affluent and privileged people parents and so they themselves were very privileged mm. and I think the wilderness and the woods and the forest provided a really grounded container for them to land mm. in who they are and start listening to that deeper part of their story and really look at their lives and I absolutely loved it and I would have done it longer but it's very it's very grueling that's the schedule and there's not enough opportunity for self care right. for instructors. No. Okay. So yeah. But I mean did was there any any overarching concept that you learned from that experience? Oh man. I think for me personally the concept was the thing I learned was the power of a of a community because the people that I worked with were very very cool and smart and we all just like on our off shifts we would hang out together and we just had an incredible bonding experience like being in the woods you know making sure these kids pulled through okay and uh. so our off shifts we we'd just do we'd play music a lot we would party we would go to swimming holes and do house concerts and I learned the value of community and friendship and how that can cover, like a lot of those people I'm still friends with through different chapters of my life. They were some of the biggest supports in Asheville when I first started playing. They would all come out to my shows and that meant the world to me. So That's killer. Yeah, so let's move on to your uh, new single and, and the new music you got coming out. The track, which I assume we're going to play on the, at the end, yeah, is called My Best. So, yeah, let's talk about the recording process and how it came about. Yeah. So we went into the studio, actually, in – it's kind of an older track. The tracking for this came in December of 2018. Okay. So almost three years ago. And there was an ice storm, and – we had to track as quickly as possible because people needed to be able to get home and it's the mountains. And so uh. we just had to keep it tight. And uh, we recorded, I think, eight tracks and we released four in September of 2019. But I didn't have enough money to put them all out. Uh -huh. So we've just been doing it as we can. We put out four and then we've got this one and then there's another one that's going to come out in late October. But... It's been neat to kind of, it was neat to like put those four that came out already. It was cool to like organize them and and now we're, we've got this single and I'm glad this is a single because I think it's a great song. So That's great. So when you play live, do you have like a larger body of work or do you do some covers? Like how does that work? Yeah, we have a lot of music that's not recorded and we we primarily play originals. We might slip one one or two covers in there, but yeah, it's, it's primarily originals. We do some jamming and, and some improv just because a lot of our players have that background. And mm. I like to, I'm a singer and I like singing and I, and uh, I also like pushing my band members to the front and letting them have 
their own moments and I enjoy watching them cut loose. So we definitely go there live. That's excellent. You know, I, I imagine if if the music's a little, you know, older, d- d- has it gone through a lot of like m- metamorphosis as you as you go, th- you know, through it m- multiple times and improvise? Like if if you recorded a track like three years ago, how different would it look today if you recorded it today? That's a great question. I think because I have so much music that we play that hasn't been tracked that like that song had been written. These songs have been written. It's, it wasn't not, it was pretty flushed out by the time we got to the studio. And so it's pretty similar to, we still play it similarly Mm -hmm. as we tracked. So, and of course, every time we play it, it, it feels live and fresh, but you know, it's not gone through any significant changes. But I see what you're saying. Right. I, I, I see a lot of musicians kind of view their albums as a timestamp rather than the definitive version until you get to the kind of Metallica and whoever level where where if you don't play it that way, then it's you know, people get really pissed off. Oh uh, yeah. That's not how it is on the album, but you know, there's other people that just don't care. <laughs> Sure, sure. It's like let's explore how it how it's going to evolve with different you know with different versions of the band often. What prompted you to start working with Joanna and you know what have you learned in kind of exploring the business side of of your music? Yeah, Joanna and I met right well we started working together right after my trio ended and I had just started the combo. Mhm. You know, I went through a breakup and and I felt really vulnerable and kind of exposed and ins- and unsure musically because it's such a big transition to, to lose a partner and a bandmate mm. at the same time. And so I was putting out just like a little live thing and she agreed to do the promotion for me. And I just really enjoyed working with her. I I had met her through Asheville Music Hall and and some mutual friends. And her spirit is just so bright and she's so intelligent. And she thinks outside the box and she loves artists. And I I just have always liked being in her presence and the way that she sees the world and she sees what art and music could be. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, we worked together back then. And then, you know, she transitioned into doing her own festival, which was really cool. And then the pandemic happened and I was like, I want to put out the single. I need some help. And I was trying to figure out, you know, I feel like the the pandemic has been a big shakeup of of who's doing what in music. Like who's booking, who's booking this venue? Is that venue even open? Is, you know, who's actually doing music? Like, and then podcasts and uh, Instagram and like neat little things like have popped up where people have gotten creative during the pandemic and are bringing music forward in a digital way in creative ways. And I wanted to tap into that. And I thought of Joanna. I hadn't, I hadn't talked to her in a couple of years. So I called her up and I was like, Hey, I'm doing this thing. What are you doing? Do you want to help me get the word out? And she was like, yeah. And I told her, I was like, I want to plug into people like you mm. who are, who are, you know, getting into this and getting, getting art and creativity to people in ways that are, you know, not traditional. And so, yeah, she's been helping me and it's been a really fun journey with her. That's killer. All right, so let's move on to the non-quickfire round of the podcast. What significant negative experience have you overcome and what did that teach you? Mm. In music or in life? Anything, anything you want to answer about. Hmm. Woo. Okay. Uh, let's see. Well, I think... I think something that is a every an everyday process of negative 
negative uh, circumstances or experience, a negative experience that I have to remain really centered on a daily basis to overcome is kind of a twofold thing that, you know, the music, music has changed in the last 10 years. People do not buy music mm-hmm. anymore. And the financial piece is, is a challenge. And that's hard, but I think the the real kind of hook is that, and it's changing, which I'm so happy to say, mm-hmm. but as a whole, even Asheville, the music scene is very sexist. And mm-hmm. most, not all, but most bookers subconsciously they're great. They're great people, but subconsciously, they're prejudiced and believe that important musicians are male musicians, and musicians mm-hmm. worth paying are male, and musicians worth promoting are male. And maybe they even book some non-male artists, but they're usually paid less on nights that are not as popular on stages that are not as popular at time slots that are not as popular and their visibility, the visibility that the venues give those non male artists is less. And Mm. that's changing slowly. And there are some really fantastic people that don't do that. They, they, they love art and they love musicians and they understand the dynamics. And so they don't function that way. Mm. And also not being a, a cis, cis female, you know, being queer. It definitely, I definitely hit a glass ceiling pretty hard sometimes. So right. the overcoming that for me looks like daily focusing on all the beautiful parts and not getting caught in what I don't have, but really enjoying and trying to be in what I do have. And I have a lot. So that's, that's a daily kind of thing. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for listening. That was a lot. I unloaded a lot. Thanks. Oh, no worries. No, I'm, I'm, I'm all about, all about that. Yeah. It's unfortunate that that still exists, but you know, it's, it's something that you know people are on our side have to just keep pushing and and hope that it kind of it, i don't think it'll ever go away but it, 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 i i do see a, a positive up, uptick in general for all, all sorts of different prejudices for for sure not just gender identity and and anything in that realm you know genre yeah, I I may you know go down a rabbit hole, but you have a podcast called Music on Your Own Terms, and I love I love that and right, absolutely, and you're changing the terms, so I hope so. I hope that's 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 one of the big part of uh, the solution goals of the yeah that's one of the big goals of the podcast is to just push good art out there, no no matter what. So yeah, next question is what major positive experience has given you the push to follow this journey oh my god i think i've said it already a bit the people in my life are my heroes and my celebrities my band bill berg zach page kyle samples jackson delaney tina collins they are my heroes and my producer michael selvern jessica thomason at echo joanna haggerty like all these people are my heroes, my sweetheart, Addie, my, all my fans in my community, like they are just, I mean, they keep our community going on a daily basis, but especially during the pandemic, you know, like it's been, you know, as a musician, you can't travel or tour safely. Mm. And right now I know a lot of musicians are playing indoors and I can't I think every musician has their own circumstance and I don't judge people for that because I think You know, if you have someone who's willing to book you and they're booking you indoors, it would be really hard to say no to that. Absolutely. But I think that's very dangerous right now. And so we're just playing outdoors and just feeling the support. It's kind of like operating with a broke, broken legs or something as an artist. You're not, you can't, 
can't be with the people you like playing with in the spaces with, mm-hmm. you know, you can't just share space like that. And so the major positive part has just been my fans and the community and the band and the way that the way that they've all, they, we've all held each other, all of us through this, you know, even the bigger community, you too, like we've, we've all had to hold each other to get, to get to this point. And I think we're going to continue to, and we're going to get through it and we're going to, we're going to learn some stuff. I mean, not that there hasn't been casualties along the way, but I really am grateful for all, all the people. That's, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that. Last question is, what does music mean to you? Who music makes the people. <laughs> mm, music. I guess music for me has been a way to, to deal with life. Like, I know, you know, whether it's playing in front of people or just by myself, it helps me feel better about life and kind of, it's a stress reliever, I guess. <laughs> If that makes sense, that's like my short answer. <laughs> it's such a stress reliever. What's the long answer? The long answer? Oh, I guess that would be the long answer too. It's such a stress reliever. <laughs> and to get together with people and play, it's just like, ah, oh, it's so cathartic. It's it's so good. Just And like watching people, like my uh, band just just like, I can, I can, I get to like, we try and get to that place where we can improv and like, you know, you know, go like put, we call our laugh steel player, the, the bus driver, Mm -hmm. you know, he can, he can really drive the bus and like, you know, Bill can, we just, I guess we all can really drive the bus and like collectively doing that is like collective stress relief. And I hope it's that way for listeners too. That's fantastic. Yeah. I, I, it's, it's such a meditative, it's almost like a meditative practice. I, you know, just before we came on, I was just, I picked up the guitar and I almost, I was almost late just because I got into playing whatever I was playing. Oh, that's fantastic. I love that. So, all right. If people want to get in touch, listen to your music, where do they go? I would say, Well, we're on Spotify and Tidal and all that Alex Krug combo. Just follow us on there. That helps a lot. People following people on Spotify, it actually is on the back end for some reason. It's very helpful. Mm -hmm. And then Instagram is probably my most up-to-date source, and that's at Alex K-R-U-G combo. Yeah, I like posting on there, and yeah. That's what we got. And I, our our single comes out, I'm not sure when this is airing, but September 10th. So people might be finding out about this after it comes out. Yeah, they will. It's uh, I believe I have this set up for the 28th. Awesome. So you'll be able to listen right away. Yep. My best. And on that note, my best. We talked about the recording of it, but is there a story behind the song itself? There actually is. So thank you for asking. So I had this line, I was playing, I I had this chord progression and this melody and these lyrics, like, I wore my best out to your place in the country. And I wrote the first verse kind of about that. And then I need, and I had, I had a chorus, I came, I had a chorus, but then I needed to write the second verse. And I was kind of stumped because I kept thinking that the song was about this character who was wearing their best and they were they had taken this journey to get back to this house out in the country where they had had some deep memories and connection to it and they were headed there and in my mind the house was now abandoned but they didn't know that yet but they're headed there and so I thought that it was the song was about this person on this journey so I kept trying to write this the second verse about that but then and it took a while. Then I realized that the song wasn't about that. The song was more about showing, wearing your best and showing. Okay. Yeah. The song was about pull, doing the best you can with the cards you've been dealt. So the course is a little bit of talk about playing cards and gambling 
And so the idea is like, you bring your best, you wear your best, and you play you play your cards the best you can, but you can't necessarily help the hand that you've been dealt. You know, like sometimes we are dealt a tough hand, and that's just what we have to show up with. And we play it we play it out in the way that we we best know how. And love is often we often think we're in control, like like that we can protect ourselves from getting hurt when it comes to love. And I think you know, obviously we, we try and make the best choices we have given the knowledge we have at the time in making decisions, but ultimately that that's all we can do and we don't have control over heartbreak or, you know, loss. We just we have to play our hand and so that's kind of what the song's about. That's fantastic. So this has been, uh, yeah, it's been a great conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time. So thank you so much. Stay in touch and continued success. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for listening. I'd really appreciate it if you would leave a review on iTunes or your favorite podcast platform, as this really helps get the word out about the podcast so other musicians can benefit from the awesome knowledge that my guests are sharing. The more the musicians community collectively learns, the stronger we will become. A rising tide lifts all ships. This episode is sponsored by the Skinny Armadillo Printing Company in Fort Worth, Texas, offering a full range of apparel decoration and promotional items, such as screen printing, embroidery, laser engraving, and much more. The Skinny Armadillo is now offering a merch fulfillment service, including on-demand printing and a custom-built web store, so you can concentrate on your music and running your business as a musician. Visit theskinnyarmadillo.com or call 817-546-1430 to learn how the Skinny Armadillo can help you take your merch to the next level. Keep pushing the needle and be excellent to each other. This is the Alex Krug Combo with My Best. To me with a hair